glad he arose today. How many of you all are glad he arose? Amen. Rise and giving honor to God, Jesus Christ, who's first in my life. I'm just tickled to death on this day. That's a Midwestern expression, tickled to death. Having a good time in the Lord. For he woke me up early this morning. Boy, I tell you, it was so dark. But the birds were already beginning to chirp. And I can imagine how it was over 2,000 years ago when the Marys uh, went to the tomb and the tomb was empty. I want to thank Reverend Johnson for reading that passage. It's one that everybody is familiar with. Uh, there's, if you read Matthew, Matthew says the same thing. You go into Mark, he says it too. He says it a little bit quicker than everybody else, but same passage, same message. And just for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about, uh, oh, I guess some qualities, some principles of what it takes to be a good person in this world today. Uh, I don't know. When you look at Jesus and you know that he was both man and God at the same time, when you look at Jesus and you realize that he suffered the same difficulties that we suffer, yet he was also divine. But he never used his divinity or his divine powers to uh, overcome any of the weaknesses or the problems that he was having. So in that sense, we can relate to Jesus. We can relate to the pressures that he was under, the political problems of that day that he was under, the disappointments that he was under, and all of the pressures that he went through the same way we do. So uh, just for a few minutes, I'd like to share with you a sermon entitled, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. You just can't keep a good man down. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, merciful Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the time that you have, this time that you allowed us to be able to say a word on your behalf. We're here celebrating the resurrection of your son, Jesus. So we ask now that you give me preaching power. Move anything that's in my way to keep me from saying what it is you would want me to say. Let Tom Cully remain seated, but let your goodness, your grace, and your mercy come forth through his voice. So some boy, some girl, some man, some woman might say, what must I do to be saved? And that is to believe in you. Pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You just can't keep a good man down. <laughs> you know, you ask the question, well, what is a good man? Talking about a good man, well, there is no official definition of a good man. Uh, if you, try to, you can't find it in the dictionary, what is a good man. Yet, there are principles and qualities that a man who is viewed as a good man should have. And these same qualities go for a woe man as well as a man. As a father of four daughters, I can attest to the overwhelming advice that any father or all fathers will give to their, their daughters. His daughter, I want you to marry a good man. And even if it's not the daughter, if it's a young woman who is preparing for marriage, or maybe it's an older woman who's preparing for marriage, your advice to that person is, darling, Get yourself a good man. <laughs> now, what is a good man? Well, there are certain qualities in the world that we can uh, suggest that a good man should have. One, he must realize that the world is full of people who are different, who have a different from himself, and he must accept all of the people. We also might say he 
should be an honest person. His word should be his bond. Hopefully, uh, he is smart. Almost sounds like a, a wedding, doesn't it? Amen. When you start putting that man and that woman together, he should at least be smart. <laughs> you know, be wise enough to understand that he doesn't know everything about everything that's around him. So he should have some kind of wisdom. Also, he should uh, be respectful. You know what I mean. He should be able to say, yes, sir, no, sir, uh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, uh, can I open the door for you? You would expect those kinds of things from a person to be respectful. He should be able to show love and being comfortable showing love in public. I mean, you know, not a, embarrassed to hold the person's hand that he loves and, and to open the door and put his arms around her. And he also should show love in a tender way, uh, giving them flowers, uh, a present, uh, being nice, uh, complimenting, never saying uh, discouraging words. You would think that. He should be a giving person, you know, give of himself. There will be people who, who, who in this world who, who, who have a harder time in life than themselves, so he should be willing to donate uh, uh, to the big brothers, to the big sisters. He should be able to give to his church, a volunteer when people need a volunteer, be able to teach, help folks, tutor, do things like that. And if he is blessed with children, he should be a loving father. No longer thinking about himself, but at least putting his children first, trying to do what's in the best for them. His priorities shift, and everything he does from that moment forward is to provide for his family. And you, you might say that those are some of the qualities of a good man. <laughs> well, these are just a few qualities and characteristic traits that you might attribute to what you would call a good man. And I'm quite sure you can probably think of many more attributes that you can add to this list. But I think uh, most of you all will agree that these are some qualities that would be a good man. Goes without saying that if this person is a good man, when he gets knocked down, he will get right back up. I remember I had told a story about the, uh, the young boy in the toy store and he was facing this balloon man. You all know the kind when you punch the balloon, it goes down and comes right back up. <laughs> and he asked his father, he says, Daddy, why is it that every time I knock this balloon man down, he comes right back up? And the father says, because he has something inside of him that causes him to pop up. Well, we know that we have something inside of us, the Holy Spirit, that allows us to pop right back up when we get knocked down. Well, but if you look at Jesus, there are three things I just want to share with you briefly about Jesus and why we think that he is a good man. John, the 13th chapter, verses 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the first thing is, Jesus loves everybody. He loves others. Love is not a passive thing. It's love is an action word. It means that you have to do something in order to show love. And Jesus is saying that People will know you have love by the way you treat other people. In other words, they will know that you are my disciples by the love you show one another. So one of the, the things is love. In Mark 10, chapter, verses 35 through 47, if you all remember that passage, that was the place where James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and asked, he says, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand 
when we go to glory. Two of the disciples want to be on either side of Jesus when we go to glory. <laughs> James and John wanted a position of power so that they would be loved, but Jesus offered them a position of love so they would be powerful. Did y'all get what I said? They wanted a position of power so that they would be loved. But he's saying, I'm going to give you love so that you will have this power. You see, Jesus told them that true greatness comes in serving others. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It is not centered in palaces and thrones, but in the hearts and lives of his followers. That's where his kingdom is. The disciple did not understand this until Jesus' resurrection. They walked with him for three years and didn't understand the power of love until his resurrection. You see, Jesus is love. His ministry was about love. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 43 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. If Jesus is living this way, you can see how nobody can keep him down. Because if he gets knocked down by his enemies, he's going to pop right back up. The second thing that I noticed about Jesus, Jesus was a person who knew what to do. He was a problem solver. I once preached a sermon about knowing what to do when no one knows what to do. You see, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter, the devil, Satan, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. We know you're hungry. We know you've been out here for 40 days and 40 nights. So if you're hungry, turn these stones to bread. You see, Jesus knew what to do when no one else knew what to do. I know that sounds like a play on words, but in reality... Sometimes you will find yourself in a situation where no one knows what to do. And then out of the blue, someone pops up and does exactly what needs to be done. So sometimes people, someone knows what to do when no one knows what to do. Well, anyway, in that gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, also it's in Mark, it's also in Luke, the gospel writer tells how Satan tests Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus denies the need for food. He denies the, the need for protection and power by refusing Satan's deceitful offers. How would Jesus solve this personal and human problem, this human desire to eat, this human desire to acquire all of the riches of the world? How would he uh, 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 solve this problem and this problem is facing us today some of us have the same problem how do you turn away from evil how do you uh, uh, you are tempted to do something that you know is not Christ like how do you solve the problem well how does Jesus solve this problem well in doing so he uses these significant words that become the foundation for how he would live his life. Scripture tells us he answered Satan in this way and this is how he solved the problem. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then Jesus said to him, get away from me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. 
You see, Jesus, faced with a problem, relies on the words of God. The words from his father to guide him in dealing with issues confronting him. Just as we should rely on the words of Jesus and his teachings to deal with issues that confront us. He fell on the word of his father being obedient. That's how he solved the problem. You see, Jesus knew how to pray. And he taught his disciples how to pray. You all know that prayer, our father which are in heaven. He taught the disciples how to pray because he knew that prayer can solve problems. Prayer can allow you to move mountains. Now, 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 I'm not saying that if you're going to pray for that mountain or have enough faith for that mountain to move, you're going to change the, uh, the, the geography of the land. No, I'm saying that if you have a problem in your life, uh, you know, you can't pay your bills on time, you, you, your, your son is acting up, uh, your daughter does not want to go to school, uh, if you have problems where you're studying for that exam and you just can't seem to understand, you, you're trying to give up smoking, you're trying to give up drinking, whatever the problem is, prayer and faith will allow that problem to move because in your life, that problem looks like a mountain. I remember when I was smoking, oh my goodness, I was smoking a cigarette and my, my, my daughter brought home a, a picture. <laughs> I said, what is that? She says, that's your lungs, all big old black circle. She said, we were taking help today in school and we had to draw the lungs when you smoke and they were all black. And I said, get away from me, Satan, get behind me. Well, giving up smoking was like a mountain. But if you pray and have enough faith, you can say, move mountain, move smoking, smooth drinking, move, uh, uh, let me go and apologize to my daughter. Let me make a phone call to my father. Let me reconcile with my mother. You can move that mountain out of your way. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying that you can pray. Don't you know that Jesus prayed before he called forth for Lazarus to come out of the grave, he prayed first. Father, thank you for giving me the power. Thank you for giving me the strength. Thank you for giving me the faith to be able to say, Lazarus, come forth. Later on, you will find that before he communed, he took the bread and he prayed and he blessed it. And then we read later before he leaves this earth, he prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and he prays for the world to come because he knows prayer works. Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 42, he says, he went away a second time and prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink, it may your will be done. He prayed in the garden because he knew he was facing the cross. He relied on his father's will. That's why when you knock him down, he comes right back up. Because he knows the power of prayer. The last thing. Sacrifice. I think that you can't keep him down because of his sacrificial uh, attitude. Yeah. Sacrifice. And that is something that we too should try to uh, have as an attribute. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb. John the 15th chapter verse, uh, chip to 15th verse, uh, chapter verse 12 says... My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Oh my goodness, now wait a minute now. Uh, some of you all may say, I'll lay my life down for Jesus, but I don't know if I want to lay my life down for you know who. He's saying, nothing is greater than this. For you to lay down your life 
Isn't that what happens when our boys and girls put on those uniforms of the United States Army and go overseas? Isn't that what they're doing? They're laying down their life for us. And some of them uh, that laying down body, come back with parts of their bodies missing. They are doing it in a sacrificial way. They are sacrificing themselves for us. No greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. You see, Isaiah foretold, he foretold the coming of Jesus' the sacrifice in these words. If you look at Isaiah, the 53rd chapter in the Old Testament, verse 6, he says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. And he did all of this on Friday. Going to the cross for us. He was the sacrificial lamb. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice on that Friday evening on a hill. There was a strange uneasiness over the people who had gathered around the cross. Matthew tells us that from the noon hour until the ninth hour, about three o'clock on that Friday evening, the blackness of all darkness had engulfed the land. It was dark as night. An unusual fear had, fear had slowly gripped the hearts of those watching what was happening on the cross. For three long hours, the terror of this darkness hung like a fog hangs over a swamp. It was as if though a sentence of judgment was being carried out on a hill called Golgotha. It was now three o'clock in the afternoon and, and now by now, most of the disciples had fled from the scene. They were afraid. They fled in fear for their safety. Only John remained at the cross. You see, the physical agony was horrible as Jesus hung on that cross. But even worse was the, the period of spiritual separation where he separated himself from God his Father. The darkness of the Friday afternoon was both physical and spiritual. This is the first time that Jesus had been separated from God. But in order for him to be the sacrificial lamb, in order for him to take on our sins, he had to remove himself from God so that sin could come in. This perplexing question that came out of his mouth, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew records it, also Mark records it, and it, 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 it epitomizes the pinnacle of Jesus' suffering. The suffering, the pain for who? For us. The pain and the agony that he suffered on the cross is at his greatest point, a point where he feels totally helpless, a point where he is all alone, a point where fear for the first time that he has been abandoned by his father. This is what Jesus dreaded as he prayed to God in that uh, prayer in Gethsemane, in that garden, that this day would not come. In the garden, he, he, he told the disciples his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He prayed not as I will, but he prayed as God's will. So he gave up his life for you, and he gave up his life for me. He made the ultimate sacrifice on that cross for you and for me. But you see, <laughs> you can't keep a good man down. Because they had nailed him to the cross, but they couldn't 
keep a good man down. You see, because Sunday is coming. Easter is coming. We, you, you see, the, the good news of Jesus' resurrection did not take place on the mountain of transfiguration where Jesus is now showing all of his glory to the disciples there. That, that, that good news did not come <laughs> in the streets of Jerusalem where the people were showing their clothes in the street and waving palms and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. For you see, the good news of Jesus' resurrection came in a lowly graveyard. Go back 2,000 years with me when these ladies who are coming to the tomb, they're coming to the tomb to prepare Jesus for his birth, for his death. For they did not have time to do it on that Friday because the Sabbath was coming. Can't you see them early in the morning Darkness is still there. And before they get to the tomb, already a battle had taken place. You see, Pilate tried to keep Jesus down, but Jesus just wouldn't stay down. Pilate washed his hands of Jesus, but Jesus still wouldn't stay down. But can't you see Jesus now wrestling with death inside the grave? Yes, he's wrestling with death. Then said, well, Pilate might not keep him down, but I'll keep him down. I've been keeping men and women down since the beginning of time. I only had one that I lost. That was Lazarus, but I got him eventually. So don't you worry, I'll keep him down. Death said, I got him. But all of a sudden, Jesus started moving around. Death said, oh, oh. I don't know what kind of man this is. I, I, I never had anybody to move around like this. Uh, uh, but Jesus got up uh, and started walking around in the tomb. And death said, oh, death, uh, wait a minute. I'm going to need a little help here. He says, uh, I'm going to call on the grave. Grave, uh, can you help me? And grave said, don't worry about it, death. Uh, I'll take care of it. I've been holding people in the grave since the beginning of time. Uh, He's not going to go anywhere. But right about then, the Spirit of God <laughs> went into Jesus Christ. He got up <laughs> just like that little balloon that the boy knocked down. And he threw those clothes off of him and walked around inside the tomb. And death said, oh, my goodness. I've been holding people since Adam, Adam and Eve days and Cain killed Abel and here he is walking around. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. And Graves said, I don't know if I can hold him death, so we better call on somebody else. And death said, ain't nobody else to call on. And right then, Jesus threw back the rock, opened up the tomb, stepped forward with all power in his right hand, Death, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory now? Step forward letting the world know that I am Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection. I am the Messiah. I am the new life. I am bringing hope to the world. I am the son of God. Don't you know who I am? And he came forth. Aren't you glad that he came forth? Because he got up, <laughs> we will get up. Because he got up, we don't have to worry. <laughs> because he got up, we will have everlasting life. Because he got up, we have salvation. He got up. Because you can't keep a good man down. Can't keep him down. Not even the grave. Not even death. Couldn't keep him down. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Let's give him some praise. Yes, yes, yes. It was not only the deed of the cross, but it was also included all that came out of the graveyard on that first Easter morning. That shows once again, that as, as it says, <coughs> excuse me, in the Bible, you can't keep a good man down. 
24th chapter of Luke, he says, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Be crucified. But on the third day, on the third day, on the third day, he will raise again. Then, and only then, they remembered those words. How you cannot keep a good man down. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. Thankful that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. Thankful that he made the supreme sacrifice for all by taking on our sins and giving up his life. But we thank you for the greater gift of his resurrection, which lets us know that we too will rise again after death. Now we ask you to continue bless us as we continue celebrating your son's resurrection. Continue celebrating it throughout this day. We pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus, the Christ. Amen. 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 We're going to ask you all to prepare yourselves for communion. When the word is preached, we make no assumption that everyone within the hearing of our voice has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I'm going to do something that's a little different than what I normally do. This is Easter Sunday. This is Resurrection Sunday. So I'm giving you an opportunity now that if you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, spent three days in a borrowed tomb, and on that third day arose with all power, then you already have salvation. But if you would like to become a member of this church, like to join a band of believers who believe as you do that Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm extending my hand to you now, and I'm inviting you now to come forth and become a member of this church. Let us rise from our seats. Let us sing, uh, let the church say amen. If there's one, come now. Let the church say amen. Let the church. Now is the time.